Thank you everybody for being with us for our final conversation in our reconciliation series and the last of our truth, action and reconciliation conversations, which we all began together last summer, which seems like such a lifetime ago. The purpose of the reconciliation conversations is to look at what it takes to create equitable communities with all of the transparency, complexity and nuance needed to rebuild systems so that everybody benefits and no one, no one is left behind or left out. We started the reconciliation conversations around the psychology of racism in December to discuss what prevents us from finding common ground on the issues of race and bias. And then seeming as though the world had changed, although we believe it remained quite the same, we had the events of January 6th, which stopped us in our tracks. That dark day was a stark illustration of the need for acknowledgement and accountability by white Americans for our long history of racism and oppression in the United States. We knew then that before we even talk about what reconciliation looks like, we need to stop and talk about the work that needs to be done first. And today, we are gonna do just that. Joining me today on the panel are two of the most accomplished, thoughtful, and brilliant people on this subject, and in my opinion, in America, both dear friends of mine, and I'm thankful for their friendship. Mr. Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation and a member of the EPU National Advisory Council. He's the author of From Generosity to Justice, A New Gospel of Wealth, and was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. His 2018 blog post with four freedoms, four responsibilities, Stop Me in My Tracks, received a huge amount of attention and really addressed accountability and responsibility in America. Mr. Bakari Sellers is the New York Times bestselling author of My Vanishing Country, a memoir, and the host of the Bakari Sellers podcast. He served four terms in the South Carolina House of Representatives, and by the way, was the youngest elected official of the United States of America, and is currently a political commentator on CNN. Thank you both, and welcome today for being with us. Yeah. So Darren, I want to start off with you. Um, in your recent blog post, Democracy, Democracy is a Threat to White Supremacy, you refer to our founding contradiction and how, although we have evolved over time into a freer, fairer nation, we have struggled to root out the strands of white supremacy in our country's DNA. And so I'm going to engage you today in a conversation about what do you think it's going to take us, take for us to dismantle white supremacy and the racist systems uh, that were created from it. Um, is it possible and can we get it done? Thank you, Mitch. It's great to be with you and Bakari, who I've had huge admiration for for many years. Um, thrilled to be here. And I think you asked uh, the most important and profound of all questions, and that is, uh, can white Americans be committed to ending white supremacy, a system that was designed by them for their benefit? to the exclusion of dignity for Black folks and others. And I think that that question, the I believe, the answer is yes. But getting there is going to be very difficult because what we know in this country is that we have a system that is not just a system of democracy that has flaws, but we have a system of economics, of a capitalism that is also flawed in the way in which it too is imbued with white supremacy. So we can't talk about democracy and politics without talking about the kind of economic system we have that has also marginalized Black folks, has marginalized our labor, and has made it so very difficult for us to catch up on the equity agenda because we never had the opportunity to build assets. We never had the opportunity to take advantage of the policies like the GI Bill. We were redlined and so private capital was intentionally kept out of our communities. And so now to talk about dismantling the systems of white supremacy without talking about the kinds of efforts that will require uh, 
a recalibration of our economics to recognize how we have been so disadvantaged, not only in the politics and the uh, de democratic uh, parts of our uh, society, but in our economics as well. Well, Bakari, I wanted you to uh, kind of weigh in here and give us your thoughts about that and, and contemplate for us, if you will, out loud, um, how do we break through this way of thinking and begin to stop this cyclical bias, this sense of oppression that comes from this institutional design that Darren talked about and generally address um, white privilege and other impacts that occur as a result of it? So first, I mean, I'm from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, you know that Mitch, um, and my mom and dad always tell me that the two most important words in the English language are the words thank you, and they're not nearly said enough. I mean, you're doing yeoman's work, Mitch. I, I had the opportunity to interview you at the University of Chicago, and that was a brilliant discussion we had. Uh, Darren, I have admired the Ford Foundation for a very long period of time and your leadership, and um, uh, it's just taking it to places that are exceeding all expectations. So. I look forward not to what you have done or what you are doing, but what you will do. Um, and so thank you very much as well. Look, I, I think that we have to, most people watching this, I think have some sense of understanding about what we're talking about, but I think it's always necessary when we're having a conversation of race to take a step back and define the context, um, kind of lay out what the goalposts are. And for me, I always use Stokely Carmichael for that. Stokely defined racism in the context of what we're talking about by saying that if you want to lynch me, that's your problem. But if you have the power to lynch me, then that's my problem. What Darren was talking about was a power construct and we have to look at it as such. I'm also very cognizant to tell folk, particularly black folk, that this issue of white supremacy and racism, um, <clears throat> institutionalized and structural racism we have in our communities and societies, it ain't on black people to solve. Um, we have a lot of issues in our communities. We have a lot of ills that we must remedy in the world, but racism throughout this country is not our fight. Um, I always tell folk that uh, many times uh, in some of the DEI work that I do or strategic comms work, et cetera, many times I tell people that the message is great, but it's the messenger uh, that is, the, is where we have the issue. And I, you recognize this, Mitch, better than anyone because you understand that it's going to take people who uh, envelop themselves or who have, or um, whether or not they know it or not, have this privilege to go into their own households and communities and have these conversations, very difficult conversations with others who look like him. I, I firmly believe that one of the difficult things we have in this country right now in deconstructing these issues of of white supremacy is we live in very siloed communities. Off, off air, we were just talking about gerrymandering, right? Well, gerrymandering, um, cable news, social media, all of these things contribute to our very siloed community where people only seek opinions that reinforce their own, seek news that reinforces their own and no longer have conversations with people of differing views. I think that, that we have to break through that. And the last thing that I'll state is and all of these are from a very 50,000 foot view. So we, as we go the next 45 minutes or so we can delve in, I think that the number one ill we have in this country is that we have an empathy deficit. I think the last four years put that on display. I think that when you see, as we uh, get near the beginning of the George Floyd trial, which is going to, uh, you know, kind of put us on edge again, or the, the one year anniversary of that eight minutes and 46 seconds with the knee on his neck, I think that that surmised um, the plight of many black folk in this country. And I, I listened to, I listened to uh, Al Sharpton give multiple, as my Yorkie goes crazy in the background. Um, I listened to Al Sharpton give multiple um, uh, eulogies uh, for George Floyd as his body was carried all throughout the country. And in each one of those eulogies, he would talk about that knee on the neck and that knee on the neck being symbolic for so much. And I would always echo that all black folk are looking for in this country is the benefit of their humanity. And that's the conversation we have to have. No one is asking for excess. No one is asking for opportunity in spite of. What we're asking for is the benefit of our humanity. And mind you, you may hear some twins running around too. Just know that I have two-year-old toddlers. So 
I have a four and a half pound Yorkie, a wife, twins, and a 15 year old. I'm working from home, guys. Well, I should have asked you how you doing with COVID. I think I have a sense of, of, of what it's like, but you also have what you named one of your kids, Stokely, as I we were did. talking I about a little bit earlier. Me and Sadie on the sofa watching Paw Patrol, listening to their daddy, <laughs> talk, the, the social construct of race. They, they're used to this by now. <laughs> God bless you. You know, it's interesting. A couple of things, just to comment on 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 your answers. Um, first of all, Darren, you you kind of moved into the to the sphere of of economics. Um, and Heather McGee just wrote a book called The Sum of Us that really is really making us think about how much we lost, um, but how much there is to gain if we if we figure that out. Uh, and and Bakari, you you said something that I think is just important, but I, I want to come back to a point about it is that it's a white person's problem. And sometimes when white people ask me, why did black people say that? I said, well, it's because it's the people who are in positions of power who have the ability to control it. And if you look at every institution in America, white people control every one of them, like by a lot, not just a little. So if things are gonna change, who else would you expect to change it? But I, I want, I'd like both of you to think about, and hopefully you, you and I know you're both courageous people, answer this, just as courageously as you can. Why do you think white people have such a hard time really letting their mind get to where we we know it should go? Seeing white privilege, seeing the benefits, seeing that it's their responsibility to do it. You guys have been around white people a lot in your lives. I've been with you in many different rooms. I'm just wondering what you think it is that makes it so hard for white people, us, to confront this issue and to deal with it. I think a lot of successful white people, especially white men, believe that for the most part, the playing field is fair. Uh, they have convinced themselves in part because they are so successful that there is something fundamentally fair. Uh, there is something that is consistent with the romanticized idea of Horatio Alder and all of this, and they see themselves through that lens. It's why you often hear, uh, at least I often hear, you know, successful white men who started out as basically middle working class who say, I started with nothing. You know, how many, how many hedge fund billionaires in, in Manhattan have I heard? I started with nothing. Um, and when you say to them, but you started in 1978, you know, Harvard Business School, whatever it may be that puts you on a track to, well, but I worked hard and my father was a bricklayer and my mother, you know, had only a high school education. I mean, so you start to hear all of the rationalizing, the fairness that they believe the system is so that that when you get to the conversation that where you have to admit that the system is not fair, it's it's it allows them to to absolve themselves of culpability. It allows them to say, "Oh, but yes, there's there's racism," and I but you know I'm supporting this charter school in Brooklyn, and it's helping a hundred black boys. You know, so I'm doing what I need to do, right? And so the hard part is saying, no, actually, there's something systemic, structural. And, you know, the reality for privileged people is that fairness feels like oppression, right? I have this amazing correspondence between Henry Ford II, who was chairman of the board of the Ford Foundation, and McGeorge Bundy, who were sparring about McGeorge Bundy wanting to bring a woman onto the board. There'd never been a woman on the board of the Ford Foundation, 1972. And, and Henry Ford II tells him, you are gonna ruin the board. We have a wonderful community of fellowship. We begin our meetings at the Brook Club, a club that only allows white Gentiles by the way, but we start our meetings at the Brook Club and it's a lovely evening of camaraderie ship that ends with smoking of cigars in the dark. And he just goes through the whole thing. And at the end, he says, the final part, he says, and you want to ruin this by demanding that a woman be allowed in the room. 
you're, and basically what he's saying is, I feel just aggrieved by your whole trying to bring fairness into this system. By trying to put a woman on the board of the Ford Foundation, you're like messing up our party. This is work. This is working for us. This is work for us. And now you want to ruin it. You want to ruin it. And so I hear today and other spheres where I am, people saying kind of the same thing, but they don't say it exactly as explicitly as Henry Ford said. But they're kind of saying, you know, this is working for us. And what do you mean when the NASDAQ uh, puts a, a new proposal out that any company on the NASDAQ exchange has to have a woman and a person of color on the board? The outcry, like, what do you mean we've got you, well, you know, and, and the hand wringing and the, oh my God, you know, and, and you're like, really? That's just fairness. Right. But, but, as, but implicit in that, and Bakar, you can um, jump in here. Implicit in that is that diversity actually is not a strength necessarily. We don't, we don't buy that as a, as a principle. Of, Even though the research shows that it is. And this is the correct. problem that's so challenging. We right. know from the research that diversity makes you a better, higher performing organization and company. And yet the same people who say they are evidence-based and show me the data and the metrics on this point of diversity and letting black folks in the room have a hard time with the data. Yeah, I think that's right. But Bakari, these same people, many, we, and we all know many of them, would not consider themselves to be hateful people. They would separate themselves aggressively from let's just say the insurrectionists and the white nationalists that we'll talk about in a minute. How do you, how do you, how do you approach that? How do you penetrate that? What do you think is really, you know, in, in, in the essence of what their uh, defensive mechanism is in that space? I mean, so to go back, I think Darren's quote that he was re that he was reaching for is to the privileged equality feels like uh, oppression, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank That's you. What he said. Um, Thank you. But you know, I I don't know the answer to your question, Mitch. Are you really you honestly have what I find to be like in the case of Jamie Harris and the hundred and nine million dollar question, right? He raised a hundred and nine million dollars in his race for United States Senator. You I mean, you're asking the question to be very specific and blunt. Why do white folk who make under fifty thousand dollars vote against their own self-interest? True that. I don't know the answer to that question. If I could figure it out, I could be governor of South Carolina. Correct. But, but, but I do think there are some notions we have to dispel in this conversation. I don't believe in economic anxiety. I don't. I think that that is a myth that has been portrayed by my friends in the media. I, I think that there are some um, common threads between uh, the black and white working class in rural America. I actually explore that in my book. Uh, of being left behind, um, trade policies, CAFTA, and NAFTA. I mean, who, who knows that better than, you know, Darren Walker and in, in the city that he that he sits now, and and think about you know the textile mills we had throughout the South, for Mitch and myself. Um, and so there is some element of that that's true, but we don't really have a great deal of economic angst in this country, uh, especially when it falls along the lines of race. We have a lot of cultural angst in this country. Right. right. And there is a there are a lot of individuals who feel as if and this is a this is just a flat out untruth. They feel as if they're being replaced. And let me not say it's a flat out untruth. They feel as if they're being replaced by black and brown people in this country. And that's not the case. In fact, we're all being replaced by technology and automation as we move forward. Um, and until we have that realization, until people begin to understand that commonality, until I think that we have to meet people where they are and have some level of understanding for who we are. It's, it's tough. It's weird. I, I would say this all the time. Whenever I have to start the conversation about HBCUs with why HBCUs still matter, like this conversation is not going to go well. Like I, I can't start from there. Is that why you're wearing that sweatshirt today? I'm Is wearing a sweatshirt. <laughs> I think I, it, this was the most expensive piece of clothing I had in the drawer. You know what I'm saying? So this this cost me almost a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so I'm going to wear it. Uh, so uh, you know, I just think that I think that we have to have a a dose of honesty and truth in our discussion. Yeah. And, you know, and this is this is my last point. I was I was speaking to a young lady in their Jewish studies program at College of Charleston a few nights ago, and she was talking about my book and she was talking about a similar question to you. She said, 
I'm from a city a lot like Denmark, um, but um, you know, I am from the Western portion of New York, very poor rural, one stop light. We have poverty. I just don't see race like you or see race that uh, intersects or interacts with our lives the same way. And I'm like, okay, well, you, she was in college at the time. So I had to ask her, I said, when you have children, will you have to have a conversation with your son or daughter about how to interact with police and come home at night? And the answer to that question is no. Right. Like as a woman, do you know that your black colleagues, uh, your, your black female colleagues are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth than you are because of the implicit biases we have in our healthcare delivery system in this country? And I said, I, although it, you may not see it in the contours of your rustic rural American experience, that issue of race and the systems that you will benefit from that I cannot or my children cannot are still there. And just because you can't see them does not mean they don't exist. Well, you make some great points. And let's just take for granted that some of it's economic, but a lot of it's cultural. And you're correct that people are feeling misplaced. Um, do you feel like once you talk to her and once you open her mind to that, that somehow she is capable of being transformed into becoming an ally and really understanding that it's not just her, but it's the institutional designs that have to be changed? Is that, is that a possible ex great expectation for white people in America? At the College of Charleston, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Or East University or Catholic University or Mary. I mean, yeah. But I don't think those who I don't really think that's who we're talking about or talking True that. about. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about because I know you, you're the youngest on the call, so you may be too too young to remember this. But let me 19, also tell you this. In 19, let, in let me also tell you this before you get to your point. Let me also tell you this. And that shit is exhausting, though. Like, yeah, I, no, no. <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> I have to have this conversation with people and explain to them like your existence and why you matter and. That's yeah. just, you just sit back and I, you just, it's tiring, but I hear you, but it's just. I, no, I'm not suggesting that you do it. Look, a lot of my, a lot of people have said to me, man, Mitch, quit asking me that question. Cause you just go talk to white people and tell them we're tired and, <laughs> and it's your job to figure it out. And I, I guess what, I guess we're all trying to figure out, you know, how just deeply insidious and Darren, you can speak to this and, and Bakar, you as well. The 19, you, you know, the Southern strategy was that was laid on top of, a strategy that's been along where you tell poor white folk and poor black folk that they ought to be hating each other um, when in fact they have common interests and common threats. And it just seems it, like, I think the question is, well, how do you penetrate uh, people's, people's senses and what specifically do we have to do as a country? Because, you know, as you said, I forgive you. I mean, I'm sorry. And I forgive you very important words, but before somebody can actually get to the, the, I forgive you, that could, that could be a long conversation that requires acknowledgement and accountability. And it seems like we're really struggling as a country to get to, to, to even a space where we can have that conversation. Well, I think, you know, Bakari uh, addresses some of this in his book. I think we do know that the way in which we have pitted, uh, been pitted against each other, particularly working class you know, when Bakari talks about the $50,000 and below who uh, don't vote in their self-interest, well, their self-interest has been constructed through the lens of white supremacy, right? So their interest has been, has been designed by white elites to teach them that what makes them better is their whiteness, in spite of the fact that they're poor and are in the same condition economically as many uh, Blacks. So they're working class, they're, they're poor, they're, they're lower income, but you're actually better than them because you are white. And they have been taught that. And that is the way in which elites and the economic system have maintained their privilege and their hold and capture, which has only grown uh, mm -hmm. of the economy and the benefits. And so to Bakari's question, they, those white people who are making $50,000 a year and less and who are 
voting against Medicare expansion because they've been told that that is going to be a giveaway to blacks or welfare to immigrants when the highest take up for that is going to be working class white people. But they've been taught and conditioned to believe that in this, uh, uh, you know, winner take all system, zero sum game, that there is no way they can win if a black person wins. And that's at the root of the problem. And until we can uh, address that and address how how wide elites, and again, we see that today in our economy. We see in Heather's book, which is a great book, um, she talks about how interviewing people who are organizing for a union and the white workers at the at the plant say, well, if the black workers are going to vote for this union, I'm going to vote, I'm going to vote against it. Because I can't imagine that if this is something they're voting for, it's going to benefit me. Now, what kind of thinking is that? That is a thinking that says our there's something else going on here that makes our interests divergent, even though your interests are completely aligned. Yeah. Well, it begs the question then, if Bakari is right, that it's really not economic anxiety, but a cultural anxiety, then no matter how much we show people economically that we're all going to do better when we have more diversity, uh, which I completely believe, my life is a testament to that. My life is so much richer because of where I grew up in the diverse community and my friends that I've learned so much from, um, both economically, spiritually, economically, in every which way, that it's really, from my perspective, not debatable. But I can understand how people would say, prove that to me. But if Bakari, you're right, that it's not economic, but it's cultural, even if we demonstrate through great research work like Heather's done in writing, what is exactly the pathway to getting them to see, to understand, and then to move uh, in a way that's thoughtful? First, understanding that everybody ain't gonna move. Yeah. That's the first thing. Um, And the second thing is, I just think that this is, this is not a political struggle as much as it's a moral struggle. Um, I hate to sound like Reverend Barber, but he's like the well, smartest. Go ahead, if you can do it. Yeah, no, Reverend Barber is like. <laughs> We're all for it, go on. Yeah, Reverend- That's like saying, I don't want to sound, I don't, I don't want to Amen. sound. <laughs> Reverend Barber always talks about this, this struggle of conscience that we're having as a country. I mean, you, we, we kind of touched on January 6th and then weaved away from it, but we're not really having a political struggle in this country anymore. I mean, the, the parties are so blurred yeah. right now. You, I, mean, I, I heard a Republican, a Republican, one of my friends, John Kasich, our friends, John Kasich, was trying to argue with me about the deficit. I was like, the Republicans haven't cared about I the heard. deficit. In, are, you, are you kidding I, me? I had to knock on the glass and say, excuse me, sir, when was the last time you cared about the deficit, right? And so you have this kind of convergence of issues where, you know, those individuals, although the parties are nowhere near the same, people look at them from the outside in saying so. And it's not a, it's not, we're not having, um, and when it comes to the issue of race, uh, although things like student loan debt um, and trying to have these discussions and even watching Joe Biden get it wrong and talking about it's Harvard versus, you know, taking care of everyone else when it's not an issue of class as much as it's a racial justice issue, because we know that the people who are struggling with student loan debt the most are black and brown individuals. But this is a issue of moral morality. This is an issue of conscience. This is why we have to meet people where they are. This is why right. everybody's not coming with you. And those individuals, when you speak to them, and like the young lady I was talking about earlier at the College of Charleston, the answer is yes. Uh, because she is someone who wants to do better, who will do better, will she be an ally? The answer is yes. Um, but everybody's not going to have that same stroke of conscience that she will. Yeah, well, you know, it's like you saying, if you could sound like Reverend Ball, but that's like me saying, if I... If I could sound like Luther Vandross, well, shoot, if you can, you should. (laughs) You probably can. uh, I don't don't know. But listen, let me let me let me kind of peel this back a little bit. You know, Bakari, I agree with you, by the way. And and I think Darren does, too, that it's that it is a spiritual and moral issue. But it's also a political issue. It's also a financial issue. It's also an economic issue. And Darren, I'm wondering if you've given any thought to like what approach the country would take. Is this like a presidential commission like they had back in the 60s 
um, when Lyndon Johnson pulled everybody together that that brought in not only the government, but the banks and, you know, Wall Street and then the healthcare industry and everybody to really kind of to look at this in, in, in an empirical way so that it's not just a spiritual and moral thing, but it's actually a functional uh, group of uh, 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 steps that we should take as a country to fix the problem. Well, I think uh, if one were to use that Kerner Commission as an example, exactly right. and it is an example, it's an example of what happens when you bring together the leading thinkers, the best data and evidence, and the diagnosis to the problem, and the problem that they were brought together was to address the problems of the Negro ghetto. And that is how it was framed. Yep. And these leading citizens said the problem of the Negro ghetto is white racism. White racism is why we have Negro ghettos. And of course, we know what President Johnson did. He shelved that report. And the Kerner Commission, while it had a little play, it received no support from the administration because it told the truth. And, and what President Johnson said to Bill Moyers and the others who were gathered with him to talk about it was, white people aren't gonna be willing to hear this. We will be elected out of office. I mean, we will be thrown out. This is gonna make the Southern strategy happen faster than, because the commission said, and so my point, Mitch, is commissions don't work if the politicians who right. convene them get an answer that makes it difficult for them politically. And so I guess I am not a fan of commissions in the traditional way in which we thought about commissions, but I am a fan of the kind of cross-sector, um, cross-cultural racial lines of collective action and bringing together people who are not all elites, not all, like, but, but people who are working on the front lines in community to problem solve. And I do think that there is a potential for us in this country in the wake of this horrific set of murders, this horrible pandemic, to be convened, to have facilitated meetings, conversations, discussion, but ultimately, um, our politics and our economics have to be addressed in this because if it's not, it's just it's an abstract, right. wonderful. Well, but Darren, I think will come up. I, I agree with your point. The problem is that people aren't taking this discussion seriously. The best example I can give you is we're having a debate right now about reparations, right? And I haven't heard my progressive friends on the left the squad and everybody else who I love, I, by the way, Ayanna Presley is one of my good friends, but I haven't heard them out there beating the drum as loudly as they are for the Green New Deal or this or that on the issue of reparations. My friends on the right brought Herschel Walker to testify yesterday. I mean, it was, it was, it, I mean, it was a, it was a joke, but so that, you know, we have to begin to, have, you, to your point, we got to get people in the room, but we got to also have serious conversations and people don't seem to be equipped to have those serious conversations. And Mitch, one of the other things I have to say, as we're talking about this, because I don't want to, I don't want our time to get away from us. And, as, and we know this, but the people watching not acknowledge it. Every ounce of political change we've ever had in this country has been because of black blood that has flowed in the streets. And I want people to understand that. You don't have the 1964-65 Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act without people being beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, without the assassinations that are happening, without the dogs and the fire hoses. You don't have the Fair Housing Act of 1968 without the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. In, in South Carolina, you don't even have the Confederate flag coming down without nine people being killed in a church. We don't even, I thought we were gonna get police reform, but we don't even get the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act through the house without a black man being killed on the street for the world to see. And so I think that the price that we have to play, pay, excuse me, 
for political change for black folk is extremely high in this country. And that has to be recognized. That has to change. Well, I think that's true. And Darren, I don't, I don't disagree with you about the current current commission. Johnson punted on that at the, at the suggestion of um, his advisors. I wonder if 50 years later though, with uh, president Biden in office, Kamala Harris as the vice president one, whether the country is willing to hear that same story again, which by the way, was absolutely correct and has not changed. Um, and two, whether or not they're ready to do something about it. And it requires something on a national level that's not necessarily federal. It could invoke state and local governments. It could invoke churches and communities to begin that conversation, which quite frankly is gonna last a little bit longer than it should, um, but whether or not it's important to start it. I know there are other people that think that that's not a good idea, but I, you can wonder about what concrete steps we have to take to provoke uh, the, the issues and, and Bakari to call the question and to say, who are we as a country? I mean, you wrote, you gave a couple of speeches about this uh, in your colleges when Dr. King wrote his last book, where do we go from here? Are we gonna choose community? Or are we gonna choose chaos? Of course, on January 6th, we chose chaos. And I think the question now is, well, well what are we gonna do now about it? I mean, I. If we're gonna be, if we're gonna, if we're gonna keep it 100, Mitch, as we always do, I don't think you should. expect Joe Biden to be FDR. I don't think that there's any expectation that we're going to have this transformative process right now. I think that the country is looking for the antithesis to what we had the last four years, which is what the traits Joe Biden brings best: things like empathy, things like a steady hand, things like a calming spirit you know, those not so tangible ideals that this country represents that we need right now. But I also think, and one of the things we haven't mentioned throughout this, this time that we've been together, is that people are hurting in ways that they haven't hurt before, both from an economic perspective and a public health perspective. My good friend, and, and you all know him well, Garland Gilchrist, the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Michigan, he lost 20 plus people in his family from COVID-19. I mean, those things are unheard of. We know COVID-19 is ravaging Black communities. And who has a well-earned distrust of the federal government when it comes to healthcare delivery? Black folk. Who also doesn't have access to the vaccine? Black folk. I saw the other day that Wells, not Wells, uh, Walgreens is going to have the vaccine now. And people were cheering. I was like, man, that's dope. Shout out to Walgreens and their new CEO. By the way, Rosalind Brewer, she's an amazing woman. Right. But- but I was like, man, we ain't got no Walgreens in Denmark. <laughs> like, where am I gonna go, go get his shot? Like, what is what are we talking about here? Like, so you have you have these you have these doldrums that we find ourselves in, and it's going to take us not looking to Washington, DC to effectuate this change, but we need bold, progressive policy solutions on a hyper-local level. That is the only way. Change does not come from DC down, change goes from local communities up. I but don't you think though that, but Kari, one of the things, okay. you know, your, your, your point that you raise about uh, COVID and how it has ravaged our community, that, I, I had this counter uh, intuitive thing that worried me about the early messaging around COVID, messaging of the facts, the facts that black and brown folks were more likely to uh, die from this after diagnosis, but white folks were less likely were were uh, less likely to die. Uh, they uh, were infected at high rates, but less likely to die. I think that the the counterintuitive part of my brain, the cynical part of my brain, was thinking, you know, this is why a lot of white people are like, right. that's okay. This isn't hurt though. I mean, <laughs> you right. saw what happened why, when why, I agree with why you. are y'all shutting all this stuff down? Right. This, exactly. isn't, this, is, this isn't affecting us. And what I, okay. what I found interesting was I really didn't hear that in the media. I mean, I heard this rush to say it's ravaging black communities, black, and then, you know, all of these terrible, horrible stories, um, you know, on the news. Mm -hmm with black people crying and going to funerals and all these things. And, I, and part of my brain, and this is maybe growing up in the South, I don't know, but like was immediately like, this is actually the wrong message because white people are like, we can check out from this COVID thing because this is really, 
not a we might yeah i might i might get get it but i ain't gonna die from it right. and i'm not about to give up my job and close my business and to, i mean because some black folks are dying yeah but sorry well, did you pick that up government no i was i was joking i said we we found out down here brian kemp and ron DeSantis said oh black folks dying let's open this thing back up <laughs> <laughs> well it was that was laid on top of this sense that you know the trump administration had from the very beginning and the tweets reflect this at least and you know, bad things are going to happen. It is what it is. And, it, you know, implicit in that is we will we will suffer through a certain number of deaths so that the rest of us can go back to work and go, look, if it's not us, you know, like if it's black folks, not us. And I think there was a there was a strain of that, Darren. And I felt that the same way, probably because I'm from the South, too, and we can hear dog whistles. I want to I want to probe you guys on on two other really kind of provocative thoughts. One is as we reflect on the events of January 6th and the terrible insurrection a many people, not mostly white people who I think this passed by without much view, but many people noted the contrast between the law enforcement reaction uh, to the peaceful protest for racial injustice this summer and the lack of law enforcement response or how they decided to step back from the Capitol. Um, you make this comparison to Black Lives Matter marches, Darren, saying that law enforcement would have used extreme force, if not live bullets, to keep the building secure. Um, I just wonder about, you know, I want y'all to talk about this a little bit, because I think this really passed a lot of white people by about how African-Americans saw the lack of preparation um, for the Capitol insurrection and the over preparation, if you will, which is inartfully put for the Black Lives Matter movement. No, I think that we started this conversation having a discussion about white supremacy. We also recognize in, in our both of our answers how difficulty how difficult it is to root white supremacy out of our everyday life and society. That same message and theme has to be restated when we talk about law enforcement. Um, first, January sixth, I don't know too many black folk that were surprised by what happened um, on January sixth. I think most people would have probably told you, I told y'all this was gonna happen. I mean, that's that's what most black folk, especially black folk of a certain age, they could see the tone and tenor. Um, they could see the words of the of the, the commander in chief. They could hear the stand back and stand by as they could see this happening. And so there was no level of surprise. But with the law enforcement interaction, um, I, I just it, it was it was it was startling to see the images of the National Guard when there was the Black Lives Matter protest on the United States Capitol versus the images of them just letting people in. And then I think, again, you know, I go back to we just want the benefits of our humanity. You saw uh, Eugene Goodman um, save Mitt Romney. I mean, that is the epitome of being Black in this country. You, you, you see somebody that needs it, you put this country on your back, you save them, and then that same person won't give you health care or give you a $15 minimum wage. Like that's that is that in itself is a synopsis of where we are in this country. And I just think that that January 6th is something that we have reaped for a very long period of time and we finally sold it. And I think that people are able to see that those words like like uh, uh, blue lives matter and all these other things were just a sham. Um, and get away from the heart of the issue. The other thing is we're trying to build coalitions to move forward is we have to recognize that most times when we see anti-Black racism, we also see very high incidence of anti-Semitism. Um, that rally showed us uh, that you had Confederate flags being flown in the United States Capitol along uh, with six MWE, six million wasn't enough shirts. Um, you saw the most vile racism and the most vile anti-Semitism standing hand in hand and side by side. You add in a little dosage of misogyny and you have a you have a just a bomb that was waiting to explode. And so for, for many of us, we, we expected this to happen and we have a law enforcement problem. We've been telling you it's been existing for a long period of time. Hopefully people see it now. Yeah. Darren, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, no, I think I think Bakari is absolutely right. And I think the the larger issue of white terrorism that a phenomenon that we have had in america certainly since emancipation but before but certainly organized white people 
terrorizing Black people, institutions, in order to extract from them um, something, right? And, and to extract the vote, uh, to extract an economic benefit or whatever it may be, or to just rob them of their dignity. And I think the hard part for white Americans is acknowledging that there are white terrorists among us and that white nationalism and white terrorism is not ahistorical. We have had this with us. That is why the right. Great Migration happened. The Great Migration didn't happen because Black people just decided to leave the South. We were terrorized in the South. We were driven out of the South and, and to Northern cities. And yes, ultimately there was an economic pull, but, but the origins of that is rooted in white domestic terrorism. Yep. And we, white Americans, have been unwilling to embrace that fact and that reality. And that's why it's so important. I mean, it's, it's sad that the, the Canadian intelligence agency has labeled the white supremacist groups in America terrorist organizations before our own mm. FBI can do that. Well, those are all fantastic points. Um, you know, for white Americans that don't have a great sense of history, the Colfax riots in Louisiana in the late 1800s are an example. Um, the same thing is true about the Liberty, which one, the Liberty Monument was actually put up to commemorate and honor the Klan that actually tried to destroy uh, a newly installed government that was being protected by a white and black police department. You had the same thing in Tulsa. I mean, throughout history. So, Darren, you make the point that not only is it not unique, it's not ahistorical, and that it, it, white mobs actually um, were responsible, as you know, for 3,000 lynchings plus that took place uh, in the South. But it takes me to another issue that I really, we've been talking about this at EPU, and I'm going to drop two names of my favorite people of all time, uh, James Baldwin, or as, or as <laughs> Eddie Cloud Jr. calls him, Jimmy, you know, said, I, 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 I maintain the right to criticize my country precisely because I love it so much. Uh, and then Dave Chappelle the other night dropped um, what was not meant to be humorous, but said, you know, the same people that yelled at Colin Kaepernick taking a knee to fight uh, police misconduct are the same people that used an American flag to beat a police officer. And so I want to ask you that, um, Darren, in your blog post, you mentioned that we have to renew our commitment to protect our democratic values and institutions from all enemies, foreign and domestic, especially those falsely portrayed, and I'm gonna put this in quotes, as patriots. And so we, we're talking now about what the word patriotism really means, who's taken the word. Uh, a number of people have taken a hard line that either you're a patriot as quote unquote, I define it, or you're not a patriot. And I think we've lost the historical context. And can we reclaim this word patriot in a way that we promote unity in, in America? Um, or is that gonna be too hard for us? Well, let us first be clear about who the patriots are and have been in this country over 400 plus years. There is no population of Americans more patriotic who have believed in the ideas upon which this country are founded. No population more willing to accept the scraps from the table and still believe in America more than black folks. We have believed in America when America refused to acknowledge our humanity. We have believed in America when America ignored our pleas for justice. We have believed knowing that unlike white Americans, we would never in our lifetime achieve equality. Langston Hughes in 1934 wrote one of his best poems, Let America Be America Again, in which he opens the first stanza 
Let America be America again. America never was America to me. So he is saying, this country has never been America to black folks. But he ends in the final stanza. But oh yes, one day America will be. So he is saying, I still believe even though this country refuses to acknowledge my humanity, I still believe it's not going to happen in my lifetime, but I believe that one day it is possible. And I think what you are seeing today is black folks and white folks too, saying we cannot wait any longer. We can't have another young poet write another poem of hope and optimism in the face of racism and denial of our humanity. So I categorically reject the idea that patriotism and patriots look a certain way, behave a certain way, put flags up in front of their houses um, as uh, exemplars of what it means to be an American patriot. I think that's right. I think people, can, Cara, I think people in this country confuse their, their prejudice with patriotism all the time. And, um, and, you know, I don't have to go back to 1934. I can just go to Amanda Gorman, right? Yeah. and how she talked about this country being unfinished, which it is. I always remind folk that I have, if you were sellers in this country, you have every right to criticize this country because the blood of my family literally flows through the soil of this great country. And we are pushing it to be better than it was and to be better than it is. There's no greater patriotism than that. And Darren was absolutely right. I mean, just the uh, the, the the toiling in the proverbial vineyard, the deaths that we've had to suffer then and now. My father's 76, I'm 36. The, the greatest indictment on this country is that we have too many of the same shared experiences. He had Emmett and Medgar, I have uh, Keith Lamont and Walter and Tamir and George and Brianna and Ahmad. He had the 16th Street Baptist Church and I have the Charleston Massacre. And so we have you know, we, we have too many of these shared experiences. When are we going to break that cycle? And whenever we are able to bring ourselves together on one accord to break that cycle, uh, then and only then can we be free. And I think that Darren and I ascribe to a notion, which is probably better discussion had amongst ourselves than having here for us all. But Darren and I ascribe to the notion, I would believe that we can't be free until we all are free. Um, some of us don't necessarily ascribe to that same notion, but, but there, there are a large amount of us that do, and that's our life mission and goal, which is why we do the work we do, um, trying to make sure that we all can one day reach that mountaintop. Well, thank you both very much. That's a great place to end it. I'm sorry. I, I would like to talk to you guys all day because this is obviously an issue that is so important that our country really can't move forward until we move through it. And I, I think you answered the question that was asked at the top of the hour. Can we have reconciliation before we have acknowledgement and accountability? Bakari, you answered it really quickly. The answer is no. And you gave us a lot to think about today. I want to thank you both for your witness, for your testimony, for your friendship. You guys have made me a better person. And I love you both for all the work that you're doing. And I, I just want to thank you for this powerful conversation. Um, there's so much work ahead and your leadership is going to help get it done. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Um, as we close the Truth Action and Reconciliation series, EPU looks forward to continuing our work on a narrative uh, with a new series called Conversations for an Equitable South. Each month, we will continue to question and challenge the barriers that have kept us from fulfilling America's promise that all men are created equal. We will add new and powerful voices to this work that will inspire and motivate us to continue to fight for justice and equity, not just across the South, but across America. Out of many, we are one. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Have a great day.